Bon, c'est pas très grave. Hein. Ok. So. So that's where we are, and uh, now we want to to do some computation. I want to present you some computation and <coughs> explain how how to compute this this object. Okay. So how to get the statistics of NJ? So to get the statistics of, of NJ, the, the good quantity to look at it's actually its generating function. Okay. So the object that I want to look at uh, is this this guy. And the average here is taken over this uh, joint distribution, okay? So that's the uh, the modulus, the, the psi modulus square, if you want. So, um, well, this is just the generating function in the sense that I can still rewrite it like that. So that's the sum from zero to infinity, exponential of minus pn times the probability that nj is equal to n, okay? So in particular, you see that the whole probability, uh, it's just a remark at this stage, but uh, the whole probability, so that means if I just look at the limit when p goes to infinity of this guy, well, that gives, me, that gives you the probability that nj is equal to zero. Okay, so that's already a nice, a nice thing, right? Because there is, this is the only term that survived. That survives in that limit, so that's already uh, a nice object for that. And on top of that, as we will see, it, it can be written in a in a nice way. Uh, how is it so? Well, it's so because nj I can write it as a sum of indicator variables. So nj of x, um, I can just write it. Sorry, yes, nj of x, uh, nj does not depend on x. Sorry, uh, it's just a sum over all the um, variables, over all, sorry, uh, this indicator function that I'm writing, or say ij of xi. So what is ij? ij is just the, the, the indicator function. Please. Oh, yes, OK. So p is just a, is just a parameter. OK, so uh, this is just, uh, so you might, so this is the generating function, right? So. Uh, this is just one uh, one parameter, so uh, that 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 allows to generate. I may think of exponential minus p to some power n. So the generating function, if I if I call z exponential minus p, that would be the sum of over z n, z to the power n times this quantity. So that's general generating function. Is is that clear? So when you have, uh, say, a series A, uh, I mean, a series of numbers, A1, A2, An, and if you want to compute the generating function of, this, of these numbers, that's generically the sum over uh, N of Z to the N, An. And that allows to generate all the things. And Z, I, I write it exponential minus P. Yeah, it's a definition. So I, I introduce p, and uh, this is a function of p. I, I, and and, and uh, what I claim is that if I know if I know this as a function of p, then by expanding it in powers of exponential minus p, I could read all these of these probabilities. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, it's important to understand what we are doing, and why we are doing that. So ij of x uh, is just the indicator function. So this is just uh, one if x is in j and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's a binary variable, 0, 1. And for that reason, uh, exponential of this quantity, you see, is just uh, the product from j equals 1 of exponential of minus p ij of xi. All right. And now, because this one is only one or zero, well, this quantity can only take two values, either one or exponential minus p. So I can, again, write it like that. I'm just writing it and then uh, we can discuss. But that's like one 
minus 1 exponential minus p times ij of xi. Okay? So I need just to check that it reproduces. So this is equal to that. So when this guy is 0, this is 1. And in this case, this is indeed 1. Now, if this guy is 1, this should be exponential minus p. And if this guy is 1, this is indeed exponential minus p. But the nice thing now is that as a function of ij, well, this one is a linear function, while this one is a nonlinear function. <laughs> and so that will be much easier to handle this guy. Okay, good. So uh, that's what I want to, 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 to use to compute this uh, generating function. Okay, so let's move on. So what I want to compute now uh, is this object. <coughs> in full generality. So uh, let me rewrite what this guy is, uh, averaged. So again, this is an integral over all dx1, dxn of the joint probability. OK? times this, these guys. This is a product from j equals 1 to n of 1 minus 1 minus exponential minus p ij of xi. OK? So that's some function of, w of, 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 of xi, sorry, j. So, and this does not depend on xj, you see? So this is just some function of xj. <coughs> just for simplicity of notation. And really what I need to compute now, uh, I just need to remember what this guy is. You remember this is just the product. This was just the product of two determinants, OK, of two Slater determinants. So I'm just injecting this now. times this product. OK, so now I, so what that, that's what I want to compute, right? I want to compute these multiple integrals of this product of determinants times this, this guy. So that looks a bit frightening. But there is a very nice formula for that, uh, which is called the Cauchy-Binet formula, which I give for you. And I will not. Uh, prove it, but uh, there is a, a proof. I mean, this is uh, you will do it in the in the homework, or at least this is one of the homework that I proposed to derive this Cauchy-Binet. So, what is Cauchy-Binet formula? Well, it says that if you have a set of uh, functions psi i and phi i's, which are integrables and a weight function w, which is also nice. Uh, so under well-defined conditions, this is what, what this says. So this can be any functions, in fact. Uh, let me call it psi and phi, but uh, and the product of w. Okay. So I have integrables formula, uh, integrable functions. Any psi i, phi i, and w, which are integrable. Uh, this can be on any subset uh, if you want to integrate only over a subset of R. Well, you can just uh, include it in this indicator function. But the nice thing is that this is just, this can be rewritten as a single determinant, okay? Up to some factorial. So this is factorial n times the determinant. 
So this is also an n by n determinant times phi, okay, psi i of x, phi i of x, w of x. Okay, so that's a quite crazy uh, identity and quite useful. So again, to show that you need to expand your determinants as the sums of permutations and do some bookkeeping uh, and perform the integrals in a uh, clever way, but at the end of the day, what you get is a simple formula. Okay, maybe you had seen before this formula, but now here I can uh, precisely use this here with psi i is just equal to phi i star. So this factorial n just cancels and we get something which is quite uh, quite nice because this is just a single determinant of what? So here, uh, let's write it explicitly. So we have an integral here of phi i of x, phi i star of x, sorry, phi j of x. And now let me include what w is. So w is just 1 minus 1 minus exponential minus p times ij of x. OK? That fine? So now the integral here are really over uh, the, the whole real line. So this term actually is quite simple because uh, these functions are uh, orthonormal. So this is just a delta ij. Okay, so that's just the identity. And I guess you recognize uh, a matrix which naturally arrives here. <coughs> so eventually, exponential of minus p and j is just a determinant of what? So the first term is just delta ij, di diagonals. But the second one, of course, is less, tri is less uh, trivial, yes, because, okay, there is this prefactor, but of course the hard thing is this guy, no, dx. So this is now a full matrix. There's no reason why it should be uh, diagonal because of this ij indicator function. Okay, yes, please. Ah, sorry. Uh, where is there a typo here? Thank you. Sorry. Well spotted. Any other typo? <laughs> okay. Okay. So that is what that, what what people usually call uh, the overlap matrix. Okay. Now, of course. Uh, this uh, and okay now you need to to analyze this so this is a, an exact formula uh, now the question is what can you do with it okay uh, well uh, you can evaluate it numerically certainly this can be useful um, but uh, the problem is that uh, usually we would like to do uh, an n by n I mean you remember that here we are dealing with n fermions and all what we have been saying up to now are just fully exact for any n but we would like to understand uh, at some point uh, what happens in the limit of large n. And that means that uh, we would like to understand what happens uh, for the large n limit of such, of, such, uh, of such integrals, of such determinants, sorry. Now the problem is that if you think a little bit about it, that n somehow uh, will, inter I mean, will enter, uh, the problem is that here the, the, the n is the size itself of this determinant. And taking the limit of large n means that you are looking at bigger and bigger matrices, but then of course, n itself will also enter into the indices that you have here, okay? Because at some point, i and j's are also close to n. And so basically, the, 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 the dependence on n becomes very intricate. And uh, in most of the cases, if you can compute this determinant explicitly because it has some nice structure, uh, this is not very convenient to do a large n analysis. Nevertheless, it turns out that this finite n by n determinant uh, can be written as a Fredholm determinant. 
which is uh, much more convenient uh, to handle. Okay, and the way uh, to do that, uh, I'm not sure I will really prove uh, the whole thing, but uh, let me just uh, give the formula and give you the idea of how to show this, uh, uh, how these things are equivalent. Well, uh, this guy here can be rewritten as a Fredholm determinant. So it's now uh, the equivalent of a determinant, but for uh, an operator. And uh, what you get is uh, just, uh, say, the identity operator, uh, say, minus 1 minus exponential of minus p times, say, ij of x kn of xy, your kernel, ij of y. Okay, so this is now uh, Fredholm determinant. Okay, so now we'll not do the full theory of Fredholm operators, and if you want to know more, you should certainly ask Filippo, who knows much more than I do on these objects, but uh, just uh, one way of th to think about this, uh, this uh, Fredholm determinant is just a trace expansion. It's usually, there are various ways to, 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 to represent a Fredholm determinant, but uh, one way of thinking about it is indeed that, uh, okay, if you write, uh, let me, uh, okay, so if you have something like this, so determinant of identity minus some, ob some object, say call it k tilde, well, you can still write it as exponential of the log of the determinant, and the log of the determinant is the trace of the log. Okay, so that would be the trace of the log of 1 minus k tilde. And this trace now has a nice, has a nice expansion. Okay, so that can be written as exponential of minus 1, uh, sum over k from 1, sorry, say of n equal 1 to infinity of the trace of k tilde to the n. Uh, divided by n. Okay? And what I do mean, what do I mean by trace in this context? Well, this is the trace for operators, so uh, the trace of k tilde, for instance, and then I, I'm sure you will understand what it means for uh, products of it, but the trace of k tilde would be simply that, okay? Right, so you have... Uh, and this formula can be useful in some cases uh, to obtain some asymptotics when k tilde, for instance, becomes small. I mean, this might be a nice way of getting some asymptotics. Anyway, this is also a way to compute that. And there are many ways to uh, compute these objects uh, uh, numerically, and that's, uh, that's also quite convenient from that point of view. Now, uh, the, 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 the reason why this is interesting is that if you want to do the, uh, the large n asymptotics of uh, such formula, well, uh, n now enters in a very simple way. Uh, it enters only through the, the kernel itself, okay? Because the determinant is already infinite, there is no n there. And what you would need to know there uh, is to compute the asymptotic forms of, the, of your kernel. So that's, of course, much more simple because the kn is just a, a two-point function, while here you had this horrible object, uh, which was an n by n uh, determinant, All right? Now, I will not do a proof of that, uh, of that identity, but just, I mean, not a detailed proof, but it can be actually uh, simply uh, shown using what is, uh, uh, using the, the so-called Sylvester identity. Um, and that's, uh, which I guess you have seen before, it's just, it says that determinant of i plus a, b is just the determinant of i plus b, a, where i is the identity. Okay, so this, uh, this can be shown like that simply. Okay, so um, let me just... Uh, okay, so this, this identity here uh, can be shown formally at least uh, that the determinant of identity plus a, b uh, is equal to the determinant of identity plus BA 
even though A and B actually are acting on different spaces. The only importance, uh, the only thing that you need to be able to do is the, to define properly this, uh, uh, this, the, this product. Uh, so here, basically, uh, what you need to define, so this is called Sylvester identity, and there are various proof of it. Uh, okay, uh, if you want, uh, I can show you how to prove that using block diagonal matrices, but okay, I don't want to do that. I just want to define, uh, to show you how one can get uh, from that identity, uh, this one. So you need to define the matrix, okay, which is a kind of an object, which is a matrix uh, in the sense that it has discrete index on the left and uh, continuous indices on the, on, on, on the right, and that's, uh, I'm defining it like that, so minus exponential of minus p times uh, phi i star of x times pj of x. Okay, so that's an object that depends on i and x. And uh, you can define the same, sorry, i, this is i. I would like to, to call it a projector, but okay, this is here. Yeah, I call it a, an indicator function. And B, uh, I just define it uh, so it's uh, an object which is B of xi this time. And this is just uh, phi i of x, pj, sorry, ij uh, of x. Okay, so uh, if I do the determinant of uh, I don't want to write it uh, explicitly, but uh, just, okay. So if you do the determinant of I plus AB, uh, that's what you would get. Okay, so this guy is the determinant of I plus AB. Okay, so when you do the, the product AB, I mean, you have indeed to sum over X, and that will produce this guy here. All right. Now, if you do the, the converse of B A, now in this case you have to sum over I, and that will produce this quantity. Okay, so that's the determinant. Of course, this proof is very formal because I assume that I can do, I can manipulate these objects, which are a little bit, you would, not, you would need to really define what these objects are, but okay, formally you see how, how, how it works. Okay? So again, uh, this formula uh, is extremely useful because uh, this is, uh, okay, uh, something that uh, you can handle, and uh, the question now is uh, what happens to, the, to this kernel, okay? So we, we, that means that the only thing that we, we need to know or to control is the, the large end limit of this kernel. Okay. Now, at the end of the day, when once you will have done that, uh, okay, various things can be computed, but for instance, you see that the whole probability, which is the limit when p goes to infinity, okay, becomes relatively simple. When p goes to infinity, this, this guy is not here. And you have the whole probability uh, for any, uh, for any uh, interval j. Okay, so that's, that's a quite, quite nice result already, okay? And that would give you, for instance, the distribution of the largest eigenvalue and this Tracy Widom distribution. Uh, we will see that uh, in a moment. So that's, uh, that's what we have. Uh, now, of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we will have results in terms of uh, Fredholm determinant. I am not saying that Fredholm determinant are very nice and simple objects to handle with. Uh, but uh, still, uh, these are uh, explicit, uh, explicit formulas, which uh, in some cases can be evaluated numerically, and in some other cases can be also related to some uh, uh, integrable system, or say, to some Perlevé system. Uh, that's something that I will not do, but uh, as, we, as we have seen yesterday, this is what has been done, for instance, uh, by Tracy and Widom for, for the Eric kernel that I want to discuss now. Okay, so the question that I want to address now, all these formulas, you see, uh, are actually valid for uh, any n. And uh, I want to, uh, to, 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 to go to, to the large n limit. Maybe one thing that, uh, that I want to clarify or be, be more precise on is uh, the whole probability. So an application of this formula, say, 
before going to the large N. <coughs> and that's the, an application to the, uh, to the largest eigenvalue, or to the, the position of the, lar the largest eigen the, of the rightmost fermion. Uh, that would be the statistics of X max. <clears throat> okay, which is the max of the Xi. Okay, so in the language, if you think of the harmonic oscillator for fermions, that would be like the lambda max of the GUE. Okay, that we have discussed yesterday. So how come is it related to that? Well, it's relatively, relatively simple because um, if you want, uh, you see, uh, imagine that uh, you have your particles. Uh, they are here. And suppose this is the rightmost particle, which is x max. Um, well, a ob natural object to look at uh, is the probability that x max is, say, less than m, OK? So the probability that x max is less than m, that means that uh, it's like you, put, you are putting a kind of hard wall here, and you are looking at all the configurations where x max is less than m. But you see that the probability of this event is exactly the same as the probability of the event that there is no particle on that side. Okay? And the probability of having no particle on that side is simply the probability that uh, this n uh, on a given interval now, which is uh, m plus infinity, is equal to 0. Okay. So this, actually, I can get uh, immediately from that formula. Uh, we have seen before that we just need to take p goes to infinity. And in that case, j will be just the projectors or the indicator function on the interval m plus infinity. Okay, So that's something that you can immediately write uh, as a Fredholm determinant. <coughs> 1 minus uh, i m plus infinity. Kn im plus infinity. Good. So that's one formula that uh, that is quite useful. And uh, now, as I said, we would like to understand the large n limit of this. So I will not have really time to do all the to the details, but. I would like to give you to flash out the main results and some of the computations that I will not have time to cover. Actually, some of them are included in the homeworks, and you will also find some um, solutions for it. But uh, right now, I just want to tell you some results which are interesting, I think, and and uh, we will arrive. I hope. Yes, we will arrive at the Tracy Widom uh, distribution and the Eric kernel. So that should be that should be fine. All right, so uh, all this was uh, perfectly fine for any n, and now I, I want to understand the asymptotics for large n. So so again, what we want to understand, we, we have seen that the only thing that we need to understand is how the kernel, how does the kernel behave, okay? Because if I know how the kernel behaves, I can compute anything I want, okay? So this is the asymptotic for large n of kn of x, y. Let's focus on a slightly simpler object, uh, which is the one-point density, so the rho n of x. Because this one is nice. It has a simple expression in terms of x. Okay, So this is, uh, by definition, now, for the harmonic oscillator, we know what to expect in the limit of large n, OK? Because the model that we are dealing with, in the case of the harmonic oscillator, is just the GUE model, OK? There is, however, a little bit, uh, a little difference with what we had seen before. 
you remember that, yeah, I should have pointed that before, but uh, when I wrote the, the joint distribution uh, for the harmonic oscillator, I arrived at the formula where the joint distribution was this van der Monde squared, so the product of xi minus xj squared, times the product of Gaussians. Now, the Gaussians uh, that we obtained, uh, they were actually of the form exponential of minus the sum of xi squared. While in the GUE case that we had studied the other day, I was insisting on having this factor A, which I was scaling like n beta by 2. So that means that there is a different scale, uh, that there is a change of scale between the, the, what we had discussed before and uh, what we are dealing with today. And uh, this translates into a different, uh, a simple uh, shift of, of a simple scale. That means that instead of having a Wigner semicircle, uh, which we are going from minus square root of 2 to plus square root of 2, well, in this case, the Wigner semicircle actually has a support which goes from minus square root of 2n and square plus square root of 2n. Okay, so th there is a square root of n difference due to the to this factor of n, which enters in a different ways in the two models, okay? So what we need, or what we know is that uh, for the harmonic oscillator, we know the result, actually. Well, this rho n of x, uh, as I said, uh, it, it takes this form, is just 1 over square root of n, times the Wigner semicircle uh, of n divided by square root of n. Okay, so uh, this is just, uh, let me write it explicitly, 1 over square root of n times the square root of 1 minus, sorry, 2 minus x by square root of n squared. Okay. So that we know. But we should not uh, forget that uh, we are actually dealing with fermions. And people have studied fermions uh, for a long time, non-interacting fermions, for a long time using different methods, and in particular using semi-classical approach. And you probably know that uh, for large n, for any v of x, uh, well, there is a famous formula which is known as the LDA formula. And the LDA, the local density approximation, actually gives you uh, an explicit form for the density, in fact, for any, for any types of potential, okay? So what I want to say is that this formula here for the Wigner semicircle, well, can also be recovered from the local density approximation, okay? So that's just a remark, but since I guess that many of, of you are familiar with, with, this, with this notion, or at least some of you, I think it's important uh, to point it out. Um, for fermions, or non-interacting fermions, we know that uh, the density uh, rho n of x uh, is given by the local density approximation, which is a semi-classical approach. So what does it tell you? Well, it tells you that rho n over x for large n uh, is just 1 over n times, okay, generically this is what you get. This is mu minus v of x, and there is a prefactor, which is uh, square root of 2 times pi, uh, over pi, sorry. Okay, so that's what uh, the LDA tells you. Now, what are these guys? What is this new guy here? This is mu. Okay, what is mu? Well, mu is simply the chemical potential, Fermi energy, in this case. Okay? So that's actually a generic formula, which is valid for any V of x, provided V of x is not too pathologic, but, uh, and this, of course, holds provided this guy is positive. Now, if v of x is x squared by 2, well, you see that, of course, we do. Uh, so for v of x equal to x squared by 2, well, the, the Fermi energy is easy to get, no? Because the, uh, the, the, the levels are just uh, uh, h bar omega uh, times k plus half. 
So the last level is basically n plus half times h bar omega. And for large n, this is just n h bar omega. So if I just set h bar equal omega equals 1, the Fermi energy mu is simply n. Okay. Now if you just uh, replace by that, well, you indeed uh, recover. Uh, this is just n minus x squared by 2. And this has exactly this form. Okay, so this Wigner uh, semicircle uh, that we were discussing in the context of uh, the Gaussian random matrices, in fact, uh, for the specific case beta equals 2, is nothing else but the LDA. Okay. Now there is another thing that I want to discuss here, which is uh, this behavior here. So if you look at uh, how the density vanishes close, so that, that tells you that uh, in general, uh, if you have some kind of potential, imagine that uh, you may have some real potential. Okay. Uh, well, this formula is valid, will be valid for, for, for this V of X. Of course, this will be valid, and uh, it tells you that it has a finite support, and the support uh, is such that this quantity remains positive. Okay. So how do I get, in general, the, 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 the support? Well, I would simply get it like that. No? If I just set mu here, well, I will have uh, a right edge, so X plus edge, and I would get uh, an X minus edge. So the density in between will be will have a form which generically will be quite different from the Wigner semicircle. But if you look at how it behaves close to the edge, well, you see that there is this square root here again. So for all these fermionic systems, it turns out that close to the edge, well, this again vanishes as a square root. Okay, so this is what I was uh, saying the other day when x edge, x goes to x edge, plus, that goes like a square root. Okay, so exactly as I was discussing in the context of random matrices the other day, I mean, in many, many models that we know, in most of the models, in fact, we know that the density, even though it, ha it may have a kind of crazy shape, at the boundary, at the, the edge of the support, it will vanish as a square root. And that says that, in fact, uh, close to that point, uh, we, that's in, that indicates that we should expect to see the same kind of Tracy Weedham uh, behavior uh, that we have discussed uh, in the context of uh, random matrices or GUE ensemble. Okay, so that means that I'm not proving this. This actually has been proved recently, uh, mathematically, uh, that uh, this is true, uh, but uh, this is already an indication uh, that you would expect that the local statistics for fermionic systems will be universal at the edge. Okay, now the question is, what is this universality? So this universality, of course, uh, now depends on the form of the limiting uh, kernel here. And again, as we have seen, uh, because of this, uh, the fact that we have a finite support, we again, or well, we know, in fact, we already know in this case, that there is a bulk region and there is an edge region. And depending on the location of X and Y, uh, well, the kernel will have a different uh, form, uh, e either in the bulk or at the edge. And that's what I want to, uh, to discuss uh, finally here. OK? So maybe let's keep this. Let's keep that. Uh, yes. Maybe. So it turns out that uh, if you look at the things in the bulk, uh, well, the limiting form is gives the, the well-known sine kernel. Oh, please, yeah. Yeah, OK, so that's, yeah. Uh, in this case, yeah, this is, this is non-interacting. Uh, and the, Sorry? 
you mean the, the, the other tri type of Tracy William distribution? So, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is less clear. Uh, what, so this is less clear because um, the reason why uh, it's not completely, uh, completely clear is that um, for non-interacting fermions, we have this very nice formula and we know that it will have this nice uh, square root of n independently of v of x. Now, uh, we know also that uh, for if you take uh, fermions uh, with this interaction that I discussed, this Calogero type of interactions, uh, well, we get for the ground state, we get the, the, the Gaussian beta ensemble, so GOE. So it's true that for that case, I will end up, or I expect to see the, uh, the, uh, the Tracy rhythm beta equals one, but that's for a model where I have this interaction plus a quadratic potential. Now your question is what happens if in this case of interacting particles, I change the potential Okay, uh, most likely this will remain uh, the same, but there is absolutely no evidence, for, I mean, no proof, no, not even good argument. So that's a fairly open question. Okay, so uh, let me first dis discuss the bulk. So let's uh, try to give... Um, uh, a rather precise. Um, okay, so let me let me be uh, so let me dis, uh, define the point X B, which is in the bulk. So let's try to be relatively general. So uh, I look at some point in the bulk. So I want to look at the vicinity of a point within the bulk with X star uh, far from uh, square root of two and minus square root of two. Okay, so I want to have to be really somewhere there. That will be X bulk, okay? And uh, I want to look at uh, the kernel for two points which would be close by uh, this point, cl close to this point. So let me introduce X, which will be XB plus uh, small X, which will be XB plus some length. Let me define what it is times capital X, and the same for this guy. So I want to look at, uh, so LN here is basically one over the density, okay? So I want to look at two points which are close by within a, dist within, within a distance which is of the order of one over the density. So that's something that we discussed the other day in the context of a um, random matrices, but this ln of xb here is just one over the uh, one over the density. Okay, for convenience, there we let me put a, let let me put a factor of pi, which is just for convenience. But the point is that uh, now in this case, um, if I just look at the limiting kernel, so if I look at the correlation between these two points, so which are between x and y, where x and y are this of this type. Well, in the limit of large n, this will converge to a nice uh, to a nice uh, uh, scaling form, uh, which will be of that form. That will be one over ln of x b. There will be a scale, and then I will get a universal function of capital X minus y. Okay, so I am again looking at two points. So the typical distance between two points here is just one over the density. So that's, this is this ln. So ln is what I used to call yesterday uh, the, the, the interparticle distance uh, in, in my model. In this case, it has some scaling with n, which is one over square root of n, because I'm scaling the things a bit differently. But what I get is this sine kernel here. So what is the sine kernel? Well, this is, I, I guess it's an object that you have seen, uh, you have seen before. So let me just uh, define it as a function of z. This sine is just sine of pi z uh, divided by z. Okay, so that's, uh, sorry. Now, uh, I will finally get it. <laughs> okay. So this result is universal in the sense that uh, it, does, it does not depend uh, on, on the potential. So all the dependence on the potential is, with, is included in this density here, okay? This again holds for non-interacting fermions. 
Okay, so okay, there, there is one, there is a way to understand this 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 the, the sine kernel by simply approximating the uh, wave function uh, close to uh, a given point simply by plane waves. Okay, and if you just uh, approximate them by plane waves and compute the associated kernel, that's what that's what you would get. Now, what happens at the edge, of course, is 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 a bit different, and. Um, let me just uh, discuss it um, at the edge, and that's where. Well, so, in the uh, yeah, okay, sorry, no, I want would like to keep this. So, what happens at the edge uh, is that you get a different uh, a different kernel. I will not do the asymptotic an analysis; it's a bit more difficult. For the harmonic oscillator, actually, you can do it by analyzing the asymptotic forms of the Hermit polynomials. So this is <coughs> the last exercise that is proposed in the in the homework of today, is how to get the formula that we'll get, that we'll show you, uh, from the Hermit uh, functions that we had uh, right from the beginning. Okay, but uh, here we'll just give you the result. So at the edge, we have seen that there is a typical length scale. Um, so the typical length is not, yeah, I should say that this guy here is of order one over square root of n. If I want to rediscuss the things like I did yesterday. Uh, now, the, so let's go back to the, to, the, to, to the bulk for a while. The support is of order square root of n, and I have n particle inside. So the typical interparticle distance is square root of n divided by n, and that's one over square root of n. Okay, so that's this quantity. Now, I was discussing uh, the other day how to get the typical scaling form. Uh, it was, uh, I was using this uh, uh, extreme value statistics argument to get, as we get yesterday, this n to the power minus two third. But since we are rescaling everything by square root of n, it's not n to the power minus two third, but it's n to the power minus two third plus half, which is n to the power minus one sixth. Okay, just because of the rescaling, uh, trivial rescaling uh, by by square root of n. So the typical length, the typical width, if you want. This is what I was calling uh, w n yesterday, but since it's not exactly exactly the same, uh, let me just call it uh, l n. Uh, this is of the order of n to the power minus one sixth. Okay, so just not to confuse you, so this is n to the power minus two third plus half. Okay, because here all the lengths have been rescaled by the square root, of, by the uh, factor square root of n. So what do I know there? Well, what I know is that uh, now if I look at the uh, the kernel close to the edge, so if I just scale k n. Uh, plus a capital X, so let me just denote it this way here, uh, divided by the typical lengths sorry X edge plus Y divided by square root of 2 N minus 1 fixed, okay, so this is the typical length scale right then this will be of that form. There will be uh, a factor. Okay, let me write it like that. So that will be. Let me try to put all the the correct factors. <coughs> Times uh, the airy kernel. But now, uh, the first observation is that here you see. Uh, I had a system which is essentially translationally invariant because if you look at what happens in the bulk on the scale which is of the order of one over the density, well, the potential, the, the particles don't feel the potential. Okay, so it's like you have a system which is locally uh, translationally invariant and therefore the correlation function only depends on x minus y. Now, clearly, close to the edge, uh, I am breaking uh, the invariance under translation, right? Because I am, there is one point which is singular above which the density is very small. And therefore, this airy kernel actually here 
does depend explicitly on both x and y, and not only on the distance, on the relative distance x minus y. Okay, so translation invariance has been broken here, and this airy kernel actually uh, can be uh, written under this form. So let me just give you uh, um, this explicit formula, uh, which is airy x. So this is the airy function. Airy prime of y minus Airy prime of x, Airy of y divided by x minus y. Well, there is also a nice uh, formula for it. Okay, so that's again uh, is uh, this kernel. Uh, so this is the Airy kernel. It is universal in the sense that it does not depend again on the uh, on the um, on the potential. Uh, so everything uh, has disappeared here. The dependence has fully disappeared. Uh, now, last comment. Uh, two last comments. The first one is that. Well. Now, if you want to compute the, uh, the distribution of the largest eigenvalues, well, clearly, uh, it's easy to argue that the correct kernel that you have to, uh, to insert here in the large n limit is indeed uh, the Airy kernel. And uh, if you compute the Fredholm determinant associated to this Airy kernel, uh, that's uh, what uh, is the tracy widom distribution for beta equals 2. Okay, so in fact, uh, this is yet, uh, we are not yet at the formula that I, get, that I gave for you yesterday. I showed you a very nice formula in terms of pan levy function, but this is precisely what Tracy and Whedon did, is to show that this thread on determinant involving the Airy kernel can be written in terms of the solution of this pan levy equation. Okay, so this is yet another uh, further step. Uh, that I didn't have time uh, to discuss, but uh, that's 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 the starting point. Uh, the other thing that I want to say, just to conclude, is why why do we get this Airy kernel? Although it was not very clear from the context, from the point of view of uh, random matrices, uh, actually from the point of view of fermions, this is relatively more expected, and one can understand more qualitatively why this Airy function uh, happens. And I will just. Uh, finish uh, with that. This will take two minutes. Uh, uh, so that's what I want to uh, what I want to show you. So um, the idea uh, is relatively simple is that uh, <coughs> so it's kind of heuristics for the Airy kernel. So let's think again. Uh, oh yes, please. Yes. Uh, yes, okay, which one then? So this one? Okay. Uh, yes, yes, so normally what is uh, converging to, uh, okay, I, I may have missed, uh, missed it, so, uh, so what the, the, the correct statement is that is 1 over ln kn goes to k airy, so k n must be l n, no sorry, uh, x by l n, I'm a bit confused now, is x by l n, no 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 you're right, so yeah sorry, I, I am mixing, this is, this, is, this is not correct, you're right, uh, this should be, yeah 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 sorry, uh, this should be indeed uh, 1 over Wn, so this is Ln actually, uh, which is then, uh, this should be Ln, okay, so that should be indeed n to the power minus 1 ticks divided by square root of 2, yeah, sorry, this was, this was the, the, the reverse, yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah. <coughs>
All right, so uh, how, I mean, how can I see that uh, the airy function uh, happens into the game? Well, uh, let's look at the kind of potential that we are looking at. Uh, we, are, we are saying that we are looking at the close to the edge, okay? So what is the edge for a generic potential? Uh, well, that's basically the, 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 the turning point, right, of, 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 this, uh, of this potential in the, long, in the semi classical language. So if you just have your Fermi energy, uh, that will fix uh, your, your edge here. Now, you have to remember that uh, the, the kernel that we are after um, is basically uh, of, is, is of that form, right? It's something which is from 1 to n, phi k of x, uh, phi k of y. Now, it's not, uh, uh, it's a fact uh, that this sum here for large n will be dominated by uh, this, uh, the, large, the large case, okay? So you will be dominated by the states uh, which are actually close to the Fermi energy. And that's the ones that will contribute to this sum. Now, if you accept that, um, if you think about uh, this, uh, these states, well, basically their energy will be very close to, to the edge and uh, will be very close to mu, and there will be non-vanishing uh, in the area close to the edge. So in other words, uh, if you want to evaluate this term here close to the edge, well, uh, you need to remember that uh, this is the equation that you have to solve, no? Uh, they actually solve this equation, v of x phi k is equal to epsilon k phi k. Now, if you are looking at what happens close to the edge, well, it's quite reasonable to uh, linearize your potential and approximate v of x by its tangent, okay? So you will get something like, which is v of x edge, phi k, plus basically x minus x edge times the first derivative, provided it's well defined, but okay. Uh, let's assume that this is the case. Okay, so if you look at it now, at, at this Schrodinger equation, if, if you just, okay, uh, change your variable and set y is simply equal x minus x edge, um, well, you see that uh, the, 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 the equation that you will get is basically this second derivative. Now, this guy will simply uh, becomes y. Okay, there will be some scale. Let me just scale it out. y phi k of y, and this one is precisely the, 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 the Fermi energy, okay? So this is just epsilon k minus mu times phi k. Now we know actually how to solve these equations, right? I mean, this is simply the, the Schrodinger equation uh, with a linear, uh, linear potential, and we know that the solutions are these uh, airy functions, okay? So at this stage, it's not totally clear why. So there were two solutions. One is this Airy AI. There is this other solution, Airy BI. But this Airy BI doesn't behave very well uh, for large uh, negative x or negative y. And therefore, at the end of the day, you just retain this Airy, this Airy uh, function. And then uh, once you insert the fact that, so this is the Airy operator. Uh, Basically, once you say that the phi k's are basically every functions, you insert it into this expression here. Well, the sum over k will become an integral, and you will get up, uh, you will end up with such, uh, with such a solution here. Okay, so the airy here are the asymptotic forms of the airy functions, of the eigenfunctions, and the sum, the integral over lambda is basically the sum over k in a small window close to the Fermi energy, okay? So that's, what you see here is that this argument is very much independent of, of the potential that you get, okay? So uh, you just need that V prime at the edge uh, is non-zero, but this is not a crazy assumption. Um, and uh, therefore this airy uh, kernel is universal for this, for these uh, fermionic models. So there are various ways to, 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 to prove that rigorously. Uh, we had some proofs using uh, uh, path integrals, and this was recently proved by mathematicians, uh, by uh, Gauthier, Lambert, and uh, Delporte. 
uh, using semi-classical techniques. So this is now well, 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 uh, well established. Um, I will just uh, ending by saying uh, uh, one word about the fact that here yeah, I've discussed only the, the case of one dimensions, but you can actually uh, extend all these techniques uh, in higher D, and uh, you can also look at what happens for this kernel. So you would have some generalizations of the Eric kernels in higher dimensions, which are known, which we had computed. Um, there are also some very nice extensions to finite temperature. Here I have only discussed the zero temperature case. Uh, but it turns out that the finite temperature limit has some very nice connection with the KPZ equation at finite time, uh, which is also quite nice. Okay, I didn't have time to, uh, uh, to, to discuss this. And I will just end up with the last remark, which is that I have been discussing here what happens uh, in real space. Okay, so I'm looking at the positions of the fermions, but it would be also natural to look at them in momentum space. Okay. Of course, for the ammonic oscillator, it's a bit trivial, no? Because uh, P and X just plays the, the, the same role. But if you start to uh, change your potential, say look at the potential which is of the form x to the power 2n, uh, well, you couldn't expect that uh, the, the statistics of the momenta and the, uh, uh, and the positions is different. And that's indeed the case, and that's something that we did. And what is quite nice is that if you look at the momenta, and in particular the statistics of the largest momenta, well, you get this multi-critical generalization of the uh, tracy rhythm distribution uh, and these uh, uh, all families of the, uh, the Perlevé functions uh, associated to Perlevé 2. And this was recently uh, uh, found uh, to occur in some models of uh, uh, random partitions uh, by Jeremy Boutier that we were discussing uh, the other day. So I guess that, uh, okay, so I will stop. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>